Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to the MIT Star Forum with Professor Sam Green on the palaces and sandcastles deconstructing Putin's power. I'm Elizabeth Wood, Professor of Russian and Soviet History and Director of the MIT Russia Program, and together with Carol Savitz, Senior Advisor to the MIT Security Studies Program, we will be hosting today's Focus on Russia talk. We, my first obligation and my most delightful one is to thank the MIT Center for International Studies Program, the MIT Security Studies Program, MIT Russia, and the MIT Star Forum, ably run by Michelle English and Laura Kerwin. I also want to quickly announce, as you may have seen in the, in the slides, that on April 9th, um, on April 12th at 12 noon, Angela Stant and Andrew, uh, Andre Kartinov will be talking about advice for President Russia, for, God, advice for President Biden dealing with Putin's Russia. Um, I want to remind you that for the audience, the Q&A feature will allow you to ask questions of our speaker. Carol Savitz will be moderating and collecting those questions. Sam Green is Professor of Russian Politics at King's College London and Director of King's, Kush King's Russia Institute. Um, prior to moving to King's, he lived and worked for 13 years in Moscow. He's got a long expertise. He's a PhD in political sociology from the London School of Economics and Political Science. Um, Sam has two books that are critical for this topic. One is the most recent, Putin v. the People, The Perilous Politics of a Divided Russia, published in 2019. And his previous book, Moscow in Movement, Power and Opposition in Putin's Russia, was published in 2014 by the Stanford University Press. Sam is bringing his expertise on Putin and Russian politics to us at a, at a very um, critical moment in Russian political development. As many of you are aware, um, uh, political opposition leader Alexei Navalny what has been uh, much in the news for his recent poisoning this summer, um, his transporting, being transported to, to Germany and then coming back to Russia where he faced imprisonment. Um, so today we're going to ask Sam Green to talk to us about what is the importance of Navalny. He's been involved in Russian politics since at least the early 2000s. He's been in involved in Russian political protests. But why is Navalny so important? What's happening with Putin? What, where do you think this is all going? So Sam Green, I'm delighted to welcome you. Palaces and sandcastles deconstructing Putin's power. Great. Thank you very much, um, uh, Elizabeth. Um, thanks, uh, Carol, as well, and to the entire team uh, at, at MIT for the uh, invitation to, um, to join you uh, this, I was going to say this afternoon, this afternoon where I am, um, just outside uh, London, but whatever time it is, uh, uh, where, uh, where you are. Uh, it, is, um, it is always a pleasure. Um, so thank you also for, uh, for setting up the questions. These are uh, big questions, not necessarily easy questions. So what I'm going to try to do is throw out some, some ideas and some perspectives that might be provocative one way or another, and then hopefully we get into a fruitful and productive conversation um, uh, after that. If you will bear with me one moment, I'm going to try to share some slides with you. Um, all right, okay, so um, three questions that I want to try to talk about a little bit um, in the next 20 minutes or so. Um, one uh, is why does Putin need a palace, right? This, this thing we had up on the, on the first slide, if you've been following the news from Russia, uh, one of the things that happened after Navalny came back to, uh, uh, to Russia from uh, his uh, convalescence in Berlin uh, was the uh, publication of an expose on, um, uh, on Putin's wealth, focusing on this, this palace that you see on your screen at the moment. So what does that mean? Why does that matter? Um, why does Putin need a palace? Do Russians care? It's part of the part of the question uh, that, that Elizabeth was was asking about uh, what impact Navalny and the opposition might be having at the moment. We'll look at that as well. Um, and then, of course, what happens next? And I'm not going to predict the future, but I'm going to try to set up some questions that we might want to think about um, as we uh, move into uh, move into whatever the future holds. So. Um, there have been a lot of attempts um, uh, to explain how Russian politics works, to put labels on Putin, to put labels on 
uh, on the system that he has presided over now since uh, 1999. Uh, one of the, uh, I think, most resonant um, came from a, a book that Karen Dewisha uh, published uh, now, ooh, going on a decade ago, uh, called Putin's Kleptocracy, um, which is about a system of power, right, uh, in which essentially the, those at the top of the socioeconomic, the political economic food chain, right, are able to, uh, as she puts it, nationalize the risk. So they, they leave a lot of the, the investment in the production of economic goods and economic rents uh, in the hands of the public, in the hands of the state, but they privatize the reward, right? So they're able to skim off of the budget and skim off of state-owned corporations, which are increasingly dominant in the Russian economy, to enrich themselves. Right. This is a system that she has um, uh, described as kleptocracy. If you've seen Catherine Belton's recent book, uh, Putin's People, um, it also tells a very similar uh, and, and related uh, uh, story. Right? Uh, at the heart of this, uh, Duisha describes um, a, a group of people at the top of the system, headed by, by Putin at the top of, of, of the hierarchy, right? um, that is built around loyalty, discipline, and and silence, right? The purpose of the group and the purpose of all of this loyalty and discipline and silence that we should tell us is to allow officials to maraud the economy with, um, uh, with impunity, right? Um, and key to the successful functioning of this system has been the, the uh, unity of all of these players uh, and their willingness to allow Putin to be the ultimate arbiter of, of, of any disputes, right? Without using uh, uh, the rule of law without using courts, without using uh, public politics uh, and, and democratic politics. Um, another uh, author, Alena Lidinova, a colleague here in, in London, has described this in, in broader terms, in terms of a system of understandings, which she refers to as, as sistema, using, using the Russian word. This is a, a system of understandings and relationships that is built around personalized relationships and personalized networks between individuals rather than uh, institutions, right, for the achievement of whether it's political ends or economic ends or anything else that you might want um, in, in Russian politics. Uh, and resources within this system, she writes, are distributed through sort of diffuse networks uh, rather than, than, than following market uh, uh, principles. Again, coming back to something that Duisha was describing in terms of blurring the line between the public and, and the private. Another political scientist, Henry Hale, has talked about this in terms of patronalism, right? Um, in terms of, of uh, uh, a system, right, uh, in which, again, politics is organized the, around the distribution of patronage. But at the core of this uh, is uh, what he describes as a, a social equilibrium built on expectations, right? The expectations that everybody in the system has, whether you're at the top of the system or the bottom of the system, that this, in fact, this distrib the distribution of, of, of patronage and, and patronalism is the purpose of the system, right? That we are not operating on the basis of uh, formal understandings, formal rules, laws, and institutions, but we're operating on the basis of, of, of informal understandings that, in fact, uh, allow us to, to subvert those formal rules. And the expectation is that everybody around you is behaving this way, right? Um, enriching themselves uh, through this process, amassing power and privilege through this process. Uh, and thus the powerful incentive for everybody is to behave the same way. Otherwise you're writing yourself out of the game. Now, I don't wanna spend a whole lot of time talking about sort of the nuances of, of social science theory when it comes to Russian politics, but I did wanna focus on the fact that all of these sort of big picture exp explanations of of Russian politics come down to expectations, right? They come down to um, uh, uh, the, these sets of sort of soft informal understandings that people have right, about what the purpose of power is and how they are supposed to behave in this system. This is true of the elite, this is true of Putin uh, himself. And that's part of the answer to the question of why Putin needs a palace, right? Putin. Uh, as a, 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 a participant in this system, right, uh, needs to be able to demonstrate that there is patronage, uh, wealth, resources, and power to be distributed, right, has to demonstrate that he is at the top of the system, right, uh, and nothing more than a palace, I suppose, can, can, can demonstrate that, and has to keep providing opportunities, right, for others to be participating in the amassing of this uh, of this patronage, right? Um, this has led to uh, the development of what we might think of as a club, right? Of, of people at the top of the, of the socioeconomic and political food chain, 
uh, uh, in Russia, which has a number of rules. Right? Um, one rule uh, is that what matters in the economy right, uh, are assets that generate rents. Right? These can be companies, um, things like Gazprom. Right? These can be uh, ministries, things like the defense ministry. These can be pieces of infrastructure like the railroads. These can be um, a region, right? Go being governor of, or mayor of Moscow or governor of an oil producing region. Right? All of these are systems that generate rents, right? generate money that can be skimmed out of a corporation, that can be skimmed out of a, of a budget. Right. Um, but anybody who holds these assets, right, who is able to control and thus extract these rents from these assets, holds them not in freehold, not in perpetuity. Right? And that's true if it's a private company or a state-owned company or a government ministry, but you hold them on leasehold. Right? The arbiter, Putin at the top of this system, is empowered to redistribute uh, any of these assets in the interest of the system as a whole whenever he sees fit. Right. Rule number two is that club members right, agree to, to relinquish their control of these assets whenever called upon uh, to do so. Right. Um, and rule number three is that if you don't observe rules number one and rules number two, right, you will find yourself uh, outside of the club uh, very quickly. And if you think about people like Mikhail Khodorkovsky, right, the ex-owner of the Yukos Oil Company, or you think about ex-Moscow mayor Yuri Lushkov, people who tried to push back right, uh, and tried to uh, use things like international relations, uh, the law, courts, political parties, the media, other things to try to secure their positions within this system. Right? They found themselves uh, on the outside looking in, if not on the inside of a prison looking out, right? Um, that's the contract that Putin has with his elite. I'll come back to a moment, uh, in, in a moment to why I think that that matters, right? Um, but there's a broader question that comes up a lot in Russian politics, particularly when we see protests on the streets as we have in the last couple of months about whether or not Russia has uh, a social contract. And here, I think there's a bit more controversy, right? Um, so, there, there, there's only weak and pretty inconsistent evidence uh, for there being any kind of a causal relationship right, between how voters are thinking about the economy, how they're feeling about their own personal well-being, or how they're feeling about how the, the, the national economy is doing as a whole, right, and their support for incumbents. And that was true when Yeltsin was in power, and that's been true for the 20 plus years that Putin has been in power. People do not tend to vote on the basis of their pocketbooks. They don't tend to um, uh, answer questions in, in polls about uh, support for Putin on the basis of their, of their pocketbooks. At the same time, right, the polling that we do have, including from independent high quality pollers and academic studies as well, uh, shows that Broadly, right, Russian citizens are aware of the degree of corruption and bad governance, right? So this, this club, this arrangement, uh, what kleptocracy, what, what uh, Karen Duisha was describing, right, is not something that Russian citizens are unaware of. In fact, people broadly understand that the system is not governed in the interest of the common citizen. And in fact, they um, uh, see Putin himself as governing, not in the interest of the common system, right? Um, there's also only minimal evidence right, of coercion um, uh, in voting or fear in, in, in survey responses. There's been a fair amount of academic research done uh, around this, and it does to maybe shift the numbers by two, three, four percent uh, uh, here and there when it comes to an election or when it comes to an opinion poll. Right? Um, but most people, despite the fact right, uh, that they understand how poorly the country is governed, right, seem to be voting for Putin for reasons uh, that have to do with something else, right? Uh, but that are also uh, genuine. All right, so this is at the heart of the argument that Graham Robertson and I tried to make in, in this book, Putin versus, versus the people that Elizabeth mentioned uh, earlier, right? Um, so our argument here uh, is that Putin, in fact, uh, needs the support of the people, or at least wants the support of the people, right? This is in part because the alternative, if you're running an authoritarian state, right, is to rule by coercion. Ruling by coercion costs a lot of money, right? You have to spend money on a coercive apparatus, on the police and, and, and on other institutions to keep people in line. Um, but it's also incredibly risky, right? Because at some point, it's going to involve violence. Uh, and using violence uh, is a tricky calculation to get right. If you use too much violence, we've got tons of, of experience, both from Russia and from around the world, that uh, if you use too much violence, you in fact provoke a backlash. Right? What you do is make it harder to stay in power rather than, uh, rather than easier. Right? Um, 
but also, right, he needs to be able to show to all of these people, right, uh, that rely on him to provide this patronage, to provide this, this wealth and this rent seeking, he needs to be able to show to them that he will continue to be able to provide this uh, for as long as, uh, as he can, right? Uh, otherwise, their interest is to get rid of him and find somebody who can keep this system going, right? The system requires some kind of, of, of public legitimation through elections, right? That the arbiter at the top of the system, the president, is, is able to win, right? So it's cheaper and easier and better, right? If Putin can keep people on sides, right? Um, rather than having to coerce them. Uh, and that's important both for his control of the masses, but also for his control of the, uh, of the elite. Right. Uh, and what Graham and I found was that the ways that Putin has been able to do this throughout most of his time in power, and we'll get to at the end to discuss whether or not this might be changing, right? uh, but that he was able to rely on a system of social expectations. Right. So I was talking about elite expectations around corruption and that sort of thing a moment ago, right? that there are uh, a set of social expectations in a system that delegitimizes difference, right? This is still an authoritarian system, a system in which Putin controls uh, all four parties in the parliament, more or less. Uh, he controls all four television stations that matter uh, with any news content. He controls uh, the police, the courts, and, uh, and, and, and much else that matters in, in Russian life, right? Um, so one thing that we find is that um, uh, people, in fact, use Putin as a symbol Right, as a uh, uh, as a sort of a, a guide star, right, to uh, minimize social friction. Right, um, you minimize friction, you minimize risk. You communicate to other people that you are a normal. The Russian word would be adequate, right? You're kind of a normal human being. You're a normal member of society. You understand. You share the same expectations, right, uh, of how things work in the world, right, by communicating your support for uh, for Putin, right, uh, and for his policies and his his attitudes, right? So this um, we find to be a, an important part of Putin's support. Emotion is another part of Putin's support. This was particularly important after uh, the annexation of Crimea uh, in 2014, when Putin's approval ratings shot up from the mid 60s to the mid uh, 80s, right? There was uh, a newfound emotional attachment uh, among uh, millions of ordinary Russians to the political community and to the, to the state. But even after Crimea, we see this uh, emotional attachment um, uh, remain, right? uh, and and media use, right? Again, interacting with with both this this um, uh, sort of risk averse nature um, uh, of of communication and this emotional attachment, um, uh, media use as something that is important again to communicating your sort of social embeddedness, your membership of a of a community, right? That you consume the media that everybody else around you is consuming essentially means that you're consuming, for most people, state-controlled or state-owned media, uh, and the messages that that, is, um, uh, that, that that is providing, right? And the reason you're doing this is not because you're looking for information to decide what's going on in the country. Most people, in fact, get the information about what's going on in the country from their friends, their relatives, and their colleagues. But you're consuming these media in order to be able to have conversations with your friends and your relatives and your colleagues. And so it's important to be on the same page. Right? Now, if we look at what's been going on uh, in uh, Russian politics and Russian economics recently, right, it has not been a, a terribly pretty picture. Right? So if we look at Putin's approval ratings, this is from the, the Levada Center, so the one independent polling agency that we have uh, in Russia. Right? We find um, that, so the, the, I apologize for this being in Russian, but the dark blue line here at the top, right, if you follow my cursor, uh, is uh, approval, right? The light blue line is, is disapproval, right? We had this period after Crimea where Putin's approval ratings was up in the, in the 80s, pretty high, um, really as high as it has ever been for him, uh, but it is now down, right, to somewhere in the mid 60s, right? So not too far above uh, historic lows. Right? One of the reasons for this, right, despite everything I said earlier, does seem to be the uh, economy, right? We have now had uh, six going on seven years of uh, either declining or stagnant real disposable incomes, right? So the money that people have left in their bank accounts after taxes uh, and, uh, and inflation uh, and um, uh, other basic necessities, right? Uh, this has 
this is the longest prolonged period right, of, of economic malaise uh, in uh, post-Soviet Russian history since the early 1990s. Right? So even though I said, I don't think that there is, we have not seen a clear relationship between economics uh, and political preferences, uh, we have also not seen the period quite like this one. Right? Um, handling of the pandemic uh, is, uh, is another issue. Right. Um, so Russia, if we look at uh, excess mortality as opposed to the official Russian statistics on COVID mortality, right, what we find is that Russian excess mortality is uh, second highest uh, in the G20 on a per capita basis. Right? Russians, again, broadly are aware of this and are not particularly trusting of the official statistics that they are uh, given. Right? So enter this man, Alexei Navalny, right? uh, opposition leader has been around prominently uh, since uh, the, about 2011, 2012, the first round of major anti-Putin uh, protests. We can go into that history uh, if you like. But he started off as a blogger, as an anti-corruption campaigner. He started off with projects like this one, the Rosiyama, right? The, the word uh, at, at the root of it means ditch, right? And it's a, or a pothole, right? The idea is that the, uh, it, it was a, an online project allowing people to post information right, about potholes in their local neighborhoods, right? Um, and then put pressure on public officials to obey the law, right? To stand up to their um, uh, obligations uh, and, and fill these potholes, which of course they never did, right? So it was a way of, of, of identifying in a very concrete manner Right, uh, poor governance. Um, this led to another crowdsource project, um, which was about identifying corruption in state uh, budgets, right? um, which then became what is Navalny's core organization now, the foundation for the fight against uh, uh, corruption. Right? Uh, underpinning all of this right, um, is an interesting approach to politics uh, from Navalny's standpoint. Right? So again, I apologize for the Russian, but if you look at the tagline uh, under his uh, name at the top of the screen, right? It says the final battle between good and neutrality, right? Um, so rather than trying to convince Russians that the country is poorly governed, right? What Navalny and his team and his allies have tried to do over the last decade or so is to convince Russians that in fact, if somebody else were to come to power like Navalny, things might actually get better. Right? Because if people support Putin at the same time that they understand that the country is poorly governed, right? Then the intuition that the opposition has, and I think this is probably correct, is that the political dividing line in Russia is not between people who think that Putin is doing a good job and people who think that he's doing a poor job. It's between people who think that he's doing a bad job, but the country has always been poorly governed and it will always be poorly governed because that's just life, right? And the smaller number of people who are inclined to support opposition figures like Navalny, who believe that things could actually possibly change, right? So that has been his approach. And he's worked really from the ground up, right? literally from the street level up, right? Um, talking about some corruption around potholes and road contracts, right? All the way up to talking about palaces, right? So in 2017, he published what was at the time his biggest uh, investigation into the um, uh, former president, then prime minister Dmitry Medvedev and his palaces and yachts and, uh, and, and vineyards. It's led to street protests calling for a crackdown on corruption, right? Uh, and then in January, um, a, uh, another video investigation uh, into um, uh, Vladimir Putin's wealth, right? Which also supported um, uh, protests that we've seen uh, up on uh, in Russian streets throughout uh, January and into early February. All right, now this does seem to be having something of an impact. So if we go again back to the data from the uh, from the Levada Center, again, um, we can go into this in more detail if you if you'd like uh, in the in the Q and A. But a couple of, of headline figures, right? So viewership, right, has gone from seven percent of survey respondents in 2017 when he did that Medvedev investigation, right, up to 26% in 2021 when we had the Putin uh, investigation, right? So roughly a quarter of the population has seen this, right? Um, even for those who haven't seen it, it's part of their news diet, right? So two out of three Russians told the Levada Center that um, uh, they were aware of uh, this investigation uh, into Putin compared to only one out of three in 2017. So this is becoming more prominent. And 17% of, the, of those who saw the film said that it, uh, it, it decreased their opinions, their, their, their um, um, feelings about Putin. 
right? Um, have a conversation about whether that's a large number or a small number. But again, I think the context in which we need to understand that is that a lot of people, in fact, did not have a great opinion of Putin to begin with and already believed him to be corrupt. So for a lot of people, these revelations will not have been all that surprising, right? Um, along with this, we're seeing some increased approval for Navalny himself and for the opposition's tactics, right? So in, uh, approval of Navalny has gone up uh, from uh, 6% uh, in 2013 to about 19 or 20% uh, over the last year. Um, and there is an age structure to this, right? So uh, the highest levels of support, about 36%, uh, are among those aged 18 to 24, uh, and then it decreases uh, as as people get older. All right, so just to, uh, to, to wrap up, where are we and where are we going, right? Again, we've had six plus years of declining or stagnant real disposable incomes. And we have to wonder whether or not we do eventually reach a point, right, in which Russians feel like they can no longer afford, right, uh, to not care about their material well being when it comes to their political preferences. We haven't gotten there yet. Uh, we, just, we haven't seen any evidence of that yet, right? but it's hard to imagine that we would not get there uh, eventually. Uh, at the same time, right, the government has essentially stopped proposing any way out of this economic malaise. Right? So Russian citizens, Russian businesses see no prospect of structural reform because the government is not talking about uh, structural reform. Um, what the government has been trying to do, right, it's been to use ideology and, and emotions and all the things that they used before that Graham and I were writing about when we talked about co-construction, right, uh, uh, to try to, to boost support for, for Putin, right, uh, and it has not been working, right, so all of these, these tricks of the trade uh, and all of these sort of non-material uh, ways by which people become attached to, to Putin as leader, right, um, seem to be giving diminishing uh, uh, returns. And as a result, the Kremlin is falling back on plan B, on its only other tool in the toolkit, which is coercion, right? So we have seen um, since 2017, an increasing amount of violence on the streets against protesters um, uh, and increasing numbers of arrests. So we saw something like, 12 to 15,000 people arrested uh, uh, during the protests around the country in, uh, in January and early February. Statistics I saw today said that of those people who were arrested, um, as many as a third uh, were given some kind of a custodial jail sentence. Right? So ramping up the level of, of coercion against uh, both the opposition and ordinary Russians who are inclined to, to support uh, uh, the opposition. So the question moving forward, um, is whether we are, in fact, beginning to see both the Kremlin and the population itself dismantle this uh, set of expectations that they have about each other, right, that has underpinned Putin's support for so long. And I will stop there. Thank you. Super, thank you. Uh, first of all, let me thank you um, very much. If we were in person, I would ask for a round of applause. So that was uh, great. We really appreciate it. And we have any number of questions from uh, the audience. So the first question that we got, hold on a second, I'm trying to read these, asked about how this compared to, um, to China, whether the system that you were describing is really similar to what's happening in other authoritarian states, namely China, the other biggie on the block, so to speak. That's a really interesting question. I should preface this by saying that, you know, I don't know that much about China uh, and have never studied it, right? Um, so making an actual comparison is, um, is difficult, right? But Russia had uh, very clearly tried to be different than China, right? At least in terms of the way it managed domestic politics, right? So um, unlike uh, China, which does insist on a monopoly of a single political party, right, Russia has held to at least an outward sort of facade of, of pluralism and has tried to leave space um, uh, over the years for some degree of civil society, some degree of, of independent media. Those degrees have narrowed over the years, right? Um, and I, I, I do feel like what we've seen um, uh, in Russia, particularly with the, the poisoning of Navalny uh, and then the response when he returned uh, has been, um, uh, I, I, I think, uh, reflective of a decision in the Kremlin to become a little bit more like China 
right? Um, particularly if they look at the way that China has handled things in Hong Kong uh, and things in Xinjiang uh, and really decided that it's going to you know, stop playing nice, for example, with the democracy movement in Hong Kong, right? um, and it doesn't really care what international or even local opinion uh, is going to be, um, that um, uh, the Kremlin may also be feeling that it's, it's time to stop playing nice uh, with its own uh, domestic opposition, that the whatever sanctions or other consequences it might bear right, uh, are um, either minimal or at least worth the price um, of um, uh, worth the benefits of ridding itself of of an opposition, particularly in a situation where it's maybe feeling politically less secure than it um, than it than it had been. Um, the problem, of course, for Russia has always been that it doesn't have the um, uh, the elite management sort of systems that China has, right? So it, 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 the, the United Russia does is not the communist. Party of China, right? Um, it does not allow for rotation of leadership. It does not really keep the elite on board the same way. Of course, we've seen China dismantle that as well under Xi, right? So uh, it's uh, the, the comparison is a is a problematic one, right? Um, but in terms of the level of coercion, um, Russia had for years really tried to avoid drawing clear red lines, right? Tried to to maintain at least some room for the opposition to operate. Um, and that period does feel like it's coming to an end. Um, one of our viewers asked a related question about why Russia has not clamped down on the internet um, the same way the Chinese have in terms of allowing for the spread of information, whether it's about Navalny or other opposition leaders. Uh, very good question. I think there's a couple of reasons for that. Um, one is that um, you know censorship of the internet has been what was a feature of the Chinese internet from, from its inception. Right? Uh, and so Chinese internet users right, have grown up kind of um, as, a, as a generation um, uh, with both an expectation that, that, that news and information is going to be filtered and censored, but also with sort of skill sets for getting around it. Um, and so one thing that uh, I think Russia worries about this from, from two perspectives. One is that if you do have a dramatic uh, clamp down on internet um, uh, freedom, right? That you might provoke a response, you might uh, provoke a backlash from yeah. uh, from people who are used to having sort of the run of the world, or at least the run of the world wide web. Um, uh, but also that you could bear that cost without it being terribly effective, because even in China, right, where uh, there are much more powerful systems than Russia has been able to invest in thus far, um, uh, they're not actually able to control information all that well. Right. Uh, they have other means. And I think Russia has really been focusing on those other means. They've been focusing on their ability to monitor the internet, to figure out where mobilization is likely to happen, and then to then target those individuals with a preemptive arrest or some other kind of harassment to make mobilization unlikely. Um, we've seen, particularly in the, in the regions, uh, particularly outside of Moscow and St. Petersburg, we've seen uh, uh, increased um, uh, prosecution of people for things that they post and share on social media uh, in particular. Uh, and, and a clamp down on the independent media, what remains of the independent media. Uh, and so I think they've decided to go that route, right? Really to try to impose self-censorship rather than um, uh, formal censorship. Right. So um, two people ask kind of parallel questions and I'm taking the liberty of pairing questions here. The first was, what really generated Navalny's popularity? Was it the attempted poisoning um, last summer? Did that make people more aware of what was going on and who he was? And the second and related question is that I think we all used to talk about Moscow and Petersburg as sort of the centers of opposition. One of Navalny's claims to fame and people who know about him are the widespread nature of his movement and the targeting of local officials and things like that. I mean, he was in Tomsk and Omsk and all these other places in Siberia. It wasn't just the people in Moscow or you know the other major cities. So what's your take on what's the strength of his popularity really? Well, popularity is a difficult concept in this, in this context, right? Because um, First of all, we you know it, it is very difficult to actually conduct polling, right? That would be um, uh, that would be accurate, right? But it does seem to be, um, you know, the the case that certainly his name recognition has gone up, right? Um, and 
uh, whether I think when we ask people, do you support him, right? Uh, do, you, do, do you do you like him? Do you think he's doing the right thing? Uh, that gets, I think, in people's minds caught up in this question of is a different kind of Russia possible, right? So even if people are inclined to agree with a lot of the things he says, right, they might see him more as a troublemaker or simply as a as um, uh, kind of just a, not a very useful person, right? If you don't actually think that politics can be proactively meaningful. Um, but his, um, uh, you know, Carol, you're, you're exactly right that he has built an infrastructure, right, uh, around the country for mobilization, um, going back uh, really to uh, the run up to the 2018 uh, presidential election, right? So he actually began this in 2016, 2017, after, after losing the Moscow mayoral election, but doing better than anybody thought he would do, right? Um, he, um, set his sights on, on, on higher office, right? and he started to build out this uh, network of, of um, uh, sort of local kind of headquarters, right, in cities around the country, which he needed in order to try to get onto the ballot for the presidential election, uh, but also would uh, participate in the work of this anti-corruption foundation, right? So it would, they would investigate, they would campaign, right? it would crowdsource sort of mobilization. Um, as a result of which, right, um, he and his, um, his network became a presence, right, in more cities uh, than really any Russian opposition organization has had um, since, uh, well, since the end of the Soviet Union, right? Um, and, uh, and that matters, right? Having that, that network, having people who understand their roles, right? Having people who are, have become professionalized, um, but also what he's been able, what this organization has been able to do that others in the Russian opposition have not, has been to produce new people, right? So it's been a network through which people who have ideas, people who have a voice, people who would like to participate, right? Can sort of percolate up using social media, using his national network, right? Uh, to make their voices heard, right? Uh, and to become part of this sort of ecosystem of, of opposition, right? Um, and he's been able, he and his colleagues have been able to do this in a way that has been sort of not internally competitive, right? So if you look around the, the, the network, right? Um, you look around the movement, you see new people coming up all the time, right? Uh, and they are able to coexist and like build on and complement the other people uh, in the network. One of the things that also means that when somebody gets put in jail, there are other people who can pick up the flag and keep, um, and keep running. Um, so I think actually his, his visibility and his popularity, if we we'll use that term, you know, are are older right, than the attempt to, to poison him. I think they're one of the one of the reasons probably behind the attempt uh, to to poison him and then to jail him uh, uh, upon his his return. A couple of people have asked uh, a related question, or maybe it's the opposite question of what really sustains Putin's power at this point. Are people, you know, when they get to go vote, are they afraid not to vote for Vladimir Putin or for United Russia? Um, and a, a side question that if it's an oligarchic system or a kleptocracy to use Karen Dewisha's term, the fact that so many of these oligarchs own property outside of Russia or seem to have ties, their kids are in school in the West or whatever, how is that really part of the system? What, what keeps the system up mm -hmm. um, versus the growing support for Navalny? Okay, um, so two parts to this, right? One is sort of what what maintains support among ordinary Russians, right? Um, and and the other is what what maintains support among non ordinary, extraordinary Russians, if we want to put it that way. Um, I think I'll start with the second part, right? So, um, if you look around, right, the people that are in the Russian elite, right, mm -hmm. um, all of them are winners from this this system. Right. Some of them are winning now less than they used to because their economy isn't doing as well either. Right. Um, some of them now find themselves in pretty subordinate positions, you know, vis-a-vis -vis where they were earlier. Right. So you used to have this kind of very fluid competition among kind of the finance types versus the oil and gas types versus the security state types. And now, you know, it's the security people at the top and then the oil and gas people under that and sort of everybody else under that. But they're still all winners, right? So if you were to reform the system, if Navalny were to come to power, right, um, particularly somebody coming to power on an anti-corruption message, right, um, at least some of these people, if not all of them, would find themselves on the outside, right? Yeah. Even if they were to push for sort of a palace coup, right, and bring somebody new in, that could end up 
pushing some people out and you have no way of knowing ahead of time, right? Whether you're going to win from a reform process or lose from it, right? Uh, and so the incentive is to stick with the status quo for as long as that status quo can be maintained. When it comes to their foreign um, uh, assets, this in fact has been, I think, a source of stability for the system, right? Because it means that um, if they find that things are not going in their direction, right? They can cash out. They can take whatever money they have in the bank, right? They can't take their company with them, but they can take whatever money they have in the bank, whatever money they've stored in banks in Switzerland or the UK or wherever, right? Um, and decamp, right? Rather than having to stay in the system and push for change, right? So it's an easier calculation. If you've studied your um, uh, political economy, you know of, of ex the exit and voice paradigm, right? And, and Albert Hirschman, right? So it's easier to exit, right, than to than to uh, express uh, voice. Uh, Karen Dewey and my colleague Gulnaz Shevardnadze also had an article a number of years ago about this idea of institutional arbitrage, right? which is that if you are in um, a, a system like Russia, right, you will always be able to make more money in a system like Russia. Um, that's a non-rule of law system, right? Then you can in a rule of law system like the UK or the US, right? Because you just get these outsized profits, right? But you can't protect your profits in that system, right? So going back to the early nineties, right? We all thought that, well, Russia would develop capitalism and then the capitalists would demand rule of law, right? And they did demand rule of law, but they found the rule of law in London, right? Um, <laughs> not in Russia, right? And so they were able, they, by using this sort of institutional arbitrage, they can have it they can have the best of both worlds, right? So again, these, these, these are supportive of each other as long as we allow them to keep parking their assets and defending them in, um, uh, in, Western. Uh, in London or in Mar-a-Lago or Trump Tower, right? Cool. Um, so um, on the, the sort of the, the ordinary Russian citizen side, um, again, I think it's an expectation game, right? So I think people look around at each other, right? And they try to figure out what's the dominant opinion Right. Um, if you don't think that politics is materially meaningful, if you don't think that a vote for somebody like Putin or somebody unlike Putin is going to have much of an impact on your material well-being, right? because in fact, whoever has been in power for the last 40 years in Russian experience has not really made anybody's life that much better. Right. Um, and so the story that most people tell themselves is, yes, that Putin sort of brought stability after Yeltsin, but that uh, my prosperity is still something I created on my own, right? In that stable environment, right? But it's down to me. And it's, it, when we interview people, it's, it is a very kind of up by the bootstraps, almost American style narrative that we hear from people. So your relationship with Putin is in fact much more about your relationship with other Russians, right? With other people around you that you say, uh, I support Putin as a way of saying to all of the other people who matter to you, right? that I'm a normal human being, right? I understand what's what, I understand the distribution of power in this country, and I just want things to stay as they are, right? Um, if you risk, if you say something else, right, uh, and you are in the majority, right, if you're part of this, this sort of socium, then um, uh, you risk finding yourself on the outside of your own social circle. Um, there is a minority, right, for whom saying that you support Putin would also put you on the outside of your social circle, right? And so in any political environment, you think about, you know, Tories and Labour in the UK, Democrats or Republicans in the US, right? Also, if, if, if you're in a, uh, uh, you know, if you're in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and you put a Trump yard sign in front of your house, right, you probably would find yourself a little uncomfortable, right? right. Um, so the difference is that in, in the US, it's kind of a 50-50 split, right? Um, in Russia, it's kind of an 80-20 split. And so um, even if you're dissatisfied, right, what you need to do is feel that um, uh, if you put that Navalny yard sign in front of your house, right, um, that enough other people are not going to hate you for it, right? Uh, and so you're constantly reading your sort of social environment. Um, and it is that, that sense of, of that sort of social consensus, I think, that, that has kept Russia's numbers, uh, Putin's numbers high. We got a couple of questions about sort of US-Russian relations and the potential for um, cooperation in general. So I'd love to hear your take on that. And one person in particular asked about the possibility of cooperating on a COVID vaccine or on the distribution of the COVID vaccines, whether it's the Sputnik or you know one of the ones that has been developed here. So. Hmm. Interesting. Um... I so, recognize that you've been doing much more Russian domestic politics, but we did get a couple of foreign policies. Yeah, no, this is, no, this, I mean, this is, these are, these are, these are the questions of the day. I mean, I think um, 
you know, it, it was great to see that uh, the Biden administration and the Kremlin very quickly, right, uh, renewed New Start, right? Uh, that was a low hanging but incredibly important fruit, right? Um, and um, so it's it's good that that happened. Beyond that, it's very hard to see a proactive um, uh, agenda from either side, right? Um, so from the Biden administration's point of view, uh, moving anywhere on the relationship with Russia because sanctions are congressional sanctions right, um, requires going out and spending capital on on, on political capital in Congress right, um, to, 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 to move that conversation. Right? Um, and given everything else that, that Biden needs to spend political capital on, it's hard to see uh, what the incentive for that uh, for that would be. Um, Plus, we've seen uh, that his administration and Secretary Blinken in particular right, have really placed the emphasis on rebuilding the relationship with the European allies. Uh, and again, um, sort of reopening the relationship with Russia is not necessarily uh, beneficial to, to that end. Um, so Russia matters, right? Uh, but we're back to kind of the, 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 the pre-Crimea phase, right, uh, in which um, you know, the things that matter to the administration, right, were kind of, you know, Iran, 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 Europe, China, 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 and then Russia, right, somewhere below that. Um, when it, um, on the Russian side, right, uh, I think it's, a, it's, it's almost a similar situation uh, in that to the extent that there is still this residual emotional mobilization for a lot of Russians mm -hmm. uh, uh, in support of the Kremlin, it is because of this sense, or the Kremlin understands it to be, because of this sense of confrontation with the West, right? Uh, and so were the Kremlin all of a sudden to pivot to a more um, uh, friendly relationship uh, with the US or with Europe for that matter. And if you saw the visit of um, uh, Burrell, just Burrell yeah. to, uh, to Moscow, right? They really did everything possible to make him feel uncomfortable, right? Uh, and to enforce, to in fact, push Europe towards more sanctions against against Russia. Um, so uh, I think actually the Kremlin has decided that it, the confrontation with the West is politically useful, uh, that sanctions are probably not likely to go anywhere anyway because they remember how long it took to get Jackson Vanek off the books. Uh, and, uh, and so even if there were a change of heart in the White House, uh, sanctions would still uh, remain in place. Uh, and so they might as well um, uh, play along. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of the vaccine, it's an interesting idea. I don't know enough about sort of the, um, the, the medical technology, right? And, and I mean, the, the, the Russian vaccine is working, right? It was published in The Lancet recently. It's effective. Lots of people are taking it. Um, um, and it has buyers both in Russia and, and, and around the world. I think there are issues in terms of production capacity, but that's not my specialty. OK. We, uh, shifting back to Russian domestic politics, a couple of um, our listeners asked about the role of the Orthodox Church and then also of the military in terms of, I guess, building the, the structures that keep Putin in power, is the way I would ask the question. Um, interesting. Uh, there is a, a really interesting book I would recommend if you're interested in this um, by uh, Dima Adamski uh, called, I think it's Nuclear Orthodoxy or something like that. Something um, like that yeah which is um, very well worth reading. Um, but, um, you know, broadly, so in 2012, right, uh, when Putin was facing his first real challenge from the streets, right, um, he started using wedge issues, right, the same way that Trump right, does or, or, or Boris Johnson does, right, uh, to try to sort of, you know, galvanize his support, right, and hive off and marginalize the opposition, right. Um, and, one of the wedge issues that he latched onto was religion um, and sort of traditional family values, so an anti-LGBTQ agenda in particular. Um, and the Russian Orthodox Church obviously was very useful for that perspective. Uh, um, but um, we've seen uh, since then, right, uh, that the church has tried to use this as an opportunity to institutionalize its influence over the Kremlin. Mm -hmm. And that's something uh, that the Kremlin has been uh, at the very least nervous about, right? Uh, and so we have seen um, the, the, the church be pushed back into a slightly more marginal position, right? It still matters symbolically, right? But it's not in the position to sort of dictate the agenda to the Kremlin. The Kremlin will pull it off a shelf when it needs it for mobilizational purposes. Um, but the church really isn't in a position to jump off the shelf itself. Um, part of this is also because Putin for all his faults um, 
is not an ethno-nationalist. He's not uh, a Slavic nationalist and not an Orthodox nationalist. Um, and he understands that Russia is a multi-ethnic country. Um, and he needs, and if he's going to continue to control the streets and control the elite, right, he needs to keep everybody on board. And so when we have seen anything resembling nationalist mobilization in Russia, for example, the, the pro-Putin rallies that they put together after the uh, Euromaidan uh, in Ukraine, right, we saw the church out there and sort of pro-Slavic uh, nationalists who do exist, obviously, in Russia, um, alongside Chechens, right, um, hoisting. So you saw portraits of, of Putin and Kadyrov, not, not this Kadyrov, but his father of the late Ahmed Kadyrov, right, um, uh, together, right, uh, in order to project that this is, this is kind of almost, if you will, a Russian civic nationalism, right, rather than, rather than ethnic and certainly rather than a religious nationalism. They've been very careful to make sure that whatever they do in supporting the Russian Orthodox Church does not come at the expense of other religions in Russia, particularly Islam. Um, so from that perspective, right, I think that the church has been hamstrung. Um, the army obviously, um, you know, became more important and got a lot of investment after um, uh, its victories uh, to a certain extent in Crimea uh, and in, uh, in Eastern Ukraine, right? Uh, we have seen uh, defense spending scale back um, as part of a broader austerity to deal with the economic uh, decline in, in recent years, but also I think to rebalance uh, a sense in the security establishment that too much of the money now was going to the military and not enough was going to the other security services. Uh, so again, I think the military was beginning to think that they could um, uh, set the agenda uh, in a way that would cement their position uh, um, uh, in, in the food chain, right? Um, and the Kremlin, again, in order to keep this sort of rent-seeking game going, right? Uh, to keep it fluid, uh, to keep it liquid, um, has pushed back uh, against that to make sure that the army does and the military does not monopolize those those positions. Right. Um, somebody asked the question about um, this image that we all have of Russia as a petrostate um, with the shift to renewables, the push for environmental um, concerns. Uh, what, what happens to, I mean, you talked about how um, the security people are at the top and the petro people, the oil and gas people were the next rung. What happens to that whole structure that's been constructed if and when the price of oil declines, right now it's up again, but declines further, if and when there really is certainly in Western Europe and the United States a shift to renewables, what happens to that, that prowess that Russia has in the oil and gas sector? It's a really good question. Um, I mean, uh, Russia had, so one of the things that Putin figured out very early on in his term, right, is that his, if, if his key goal is sovereignty, right, mm -hmm. if you're not solvent, you're not sovereign. And so maintaining fiscal discipline and the professional management of the economy has been important to him from the get-go, right? He's kept these people in, in important positions. The Russian central bank is among the best managed central banks in the world. The Russian finance ministry is very carefully managed, right? Um, and, and it's a very austere budget. They could spend much, much more money than they, than they do, right? Um, they could borrow a lot more than they do, but they keep things, they run a very tight ship in, in that respect. Um, and that's because they recognize, I think, the, the, the potential that obviously oil prices go both up and down, right? Uh, and they need to be able to weather those storms. They have built up um, sovereign wealth funds. Those were depleted to a certain extent um, uh, during the currency crises and the, and the sanctions that they faced in the early days after Crimea. Um, uh, but they have restocked them, right, uh, to, to a large extent um, in, in the ensuing years. Uh, and so they feel like they can weather most short-term storms, right? Um, they um, also have, uh, they understand what's going on, right? Uh, clearly they're not, I mean, they, these are professional people, they know the markets, they operate on global markets, right? So they understand what's going on with renewables, they understand what's going on with general shifts in energy balances, right? Um, but uh, I think they also feel, look, we've got this oil and this gas in the ground, right? Um, there's probably a limited amount of time in which we can uh, get money out of it, right? Uh, and so we might as well get as much of it out of the ground now as possible. And so we've seen them, uh, despite the, uh, the OPEC plus agreement with Saudi, um, we've seen them in fact, um, try to maintain the highest possible levels of, of oil production in, in particular, right? Uh, and, and constantly opening up new, new, um, 
pipelines and other things in order to, to monetize all of this, right? Um, so uh, now from a, in a theoretical perspective, I think if you talk to the policymakers, what they would tell you is, well, we, we make all this money now, right? We invest it in scientific infrastructure and in education and other things so that when that new economy comes, right, we uh, now are in a place to, to, to capitalize on those uh, investments. The problem, of course, is that a lot of that money is being misinvested and misspent, right? Um, and is op is ending up in, in in palaces rather than in universities and, and that sort of thing. Um, and so, um, uh, given you know the, the 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 nature of how Russia is governed, that's probably to a large extent uh, inevitable, right? Um, and I don't think that you know the people at the top don't recognize that. I think they recognize probably quite clearly how poorly they themselves are governing uh, uh, the system. But nobody's going to be the first mover because of this set of expectations and this social equilibrium I was talking about earlier. Nobody's going to be the first mover to say, I'm going to be the first person right, to, to, to spend the budget uh, honestly, right? because then you place yourself outside of this system. And in fact, you become a liability to the system. Um, so it's, it's a very difficult nut to, not to crack. Right. Well, we only have about two minutes left, but I was dying to ask you a question about sort of Russian nationalism because you mentioned it before. Um, on the one hand, you seem to argue that what Putin has been arguing for is a kind of civic nationalism as opposed to ethnic nationalism. On the other hand, there are a lot of people, Paul Goebel among others, writing about the, the efforts to sort of quash local uses of local languages, trying to subvert some of the autonomies within the Russian Federation. At some point, there has to be a, a breaking point or a clash between these two ideas. You know, I buy the civic nationalism, but I also understand there could be pushback from some of the smaller nationality groups that yeah. are, you know, negatively affected by Putin's policies. Yeah, and we do see regional governments, particularly in the Volga republics and other places, right? Actually, you know, subverting some of these um, uh, some of these attempts, right? Mm -hmm. um, and we do see opposition to it. And I think the Kremlin has has to be careful, and I don't think they are being as careful as they need to be, right? Uh, to make sure that they don't uh, provoke backlashes, right? Because the, the the surest way, right, to create a, a, a mobilized say, Tata or Bashkort Bashkir identity, and we saw this in the 1990s, right, yeah. is to push um, a great Slavic uh, identity, right, or an Orthodox identity. They've been more careful about this to an extent in the Caucasus because it's already blown up on them before, right, um, and, yeah. uh, and they don't, um, uh, I don't think they, they necessarily recognize the degree to which that can be uh, an issue in, the, in, in, in other parts of the country. There is chauvinism and ethno-nationalism in, in Russia, right, um, but the Kremlin has <clears throat> actually, you know, usually been at odds with with the the, the, the Slavic nationalist community uh, in in Russia. So they've tried sort of not to antagonize them every once in a while to do something that that will sort of keep them more or less in line, right? In fact, the war in Donbas was the biggest gift that they ever gave to the nationalists. Um, but um, uh, but they've also been very careful to make sure that they're not they're not setting the agenda. Right. I think where there is a problem, right, is that, um, you know, whether you're talking about Putin or you're talking about Navalny, um, it's another conversation we haven't had, right, right but exactly. um, is that there is, um, uh, there, there is a deep-seated stratum of uh, kind of what we might think is of as sort of just chauvinist common sense almost um, uh, in, in a large part of the political class, right? Um, and that's true whether you're talking about the liberals or whether you're talking about um, those who support uh, Putin and, and United Russia, right? There is a, a sense of the importance of, of Russian Slavicness and, and, and identity at the core of this state, but recognizing you don't want to, to antagonize the other parts of the state that you need to govern. Right. Well, we've hit 101 to be exact, at least East Coast time. So first of all, let me thank our audience. There were over 200 people at one point. So we're delighted that you all were able to join us. And Sam, I can't thank you enough. Um, I, th I think this was great. And I think we got a really nuanced picture of both the Navalny forces and of uh, the state. and it's vulnerabilities and yet it's ongoing strengths. It's, it's you know, very different from 
the picture even in the, you know, the front page of the New York Times, Navalny did this, they arrested him, they put him in jail, and isn't it terrible, but Putin is still strong. I think we got a very much different, a very different kind of a, a picture, and also a lot of things for us to keep an eye on. So thank you so much. And again, as I said before, jokingly, if we were in person, um, I applaud you and thanks for taking the time to join us today. We really appreciate it. Thank you. And thank thanks you very to much Jill and Laura and Elizabeth. Yeah. We're all doing great. Thank you. Stay safe and healthy. You thank you. Great. Thanks, Sam. That was good. Great.